evening. My name is Jeanette. Welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar on meeting food regulations. For my dinner tonight, I had home reared steak. Tonight's webinar is for those of you who are wanting to take the next step and start selling meat locally. Uh, during tonight's webinar, Jane is going to help us navigate the rules and regulations about selling small quantities of meat in your local area. Tonight's format will be Jane's presentation and then followed by a Q&A session. So I'd like to hand over now to Jane from SAC Open, who's going to lead the presentation tonight. Thank you, Jane. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I will start this presentation with a caveat. I did ask some environmental health officers to join us tonight, and I didn't even get a reply to this. So I will say that I have done a lot of research in the last few days to pull together this presentation. So I'm starting from a point of not total ignorance, but maybe one step up on this. So I'm hoping if we can't answer your questions tonight, we will pass them on, we'll find out the answers for you. It is aimed very much at people who are starting out. So with that, we'll start on the first slide, which if my screen is going to do it properly, there we go, first steps. Right, just in case there's any of you on in tonight who are think, have just decided to take on a piece of land and they want to get started with it, you should be, the first thing you must do, you register with Animal Health Scotland. You will be responsible for the health and welfare of your livestock and you must be registered to do that. This will trigger the Scripted will allocate your location code, you'll get a flock mark, a herd number, and all these things will be allocated to you. I would recommend you contact Scripted yourself and they will advise on what forms need to be filled in. So we'll move on to the next one. Right, so looking at this, I decided I looked for what is primary production. That is what you will be doing. You'll be producing on farm uh, to sell to the to the public. So the production, rearing or growing of primary products, including animals prior to slaughter. So that, that covers rearing of meat. There are two facets to this, there's food and there's feed. So there's your definition of food, definition of feed. There's a bit of crossover there, as you can see, animals prior to slaughter. Also, of course, it includes hunting, deer etc and fishing they're all they're all classified under this so the next one is exemptions now this was a great surprise to me um i expected all small producers to be come under all the regulations but they don't and you can see there this is this is quotes from the environmental health site and it's a direct supply by the producer of small quantities of primary products to the final consumer or local retail establishments, directly supplying the final consumer. That's the key words there I've highlighted. And that doesn't mean that you can walk away and not, not pay any heed to any regulations because that's, that's just not, that's not the way it is. So let's look at that. Again, for feed, direct supply of small quantities. Now, for the purposes of feed, small quantities has been defined as less than 20 tonnes per annum. So if you have a few extra bales of silage and you sell them to your neighbour or somebody down the road, that's fine, that, you're okay with that. You're not classified as it. So what we're going to look at is the things that you need to be aware of. I know that it saves you are exempt from the vast majority of regulations, but you still need to be aware of some of the problems that you might be faced with. Farm to plate, that's what we're looking at here. Farm to plate, your, what you grow on your farm is ultimately going to land up on somebody's dinner plate, whether that's in a domestic setting or in a restaurant or wherever, you, that's what's going to happen to it. And you need, to be able to, the, well, the authorities need to be able to trace it. it. Traceability is the key to it. And part of that traceability is you keeping records. You'll all know that 
For those of you who've got livestock already, you'll know that you livestock records, it's a key requirement of keeping livestock. You have to keep your right, records up to date through SAMO, through BCMS, all these places. You also should be keeping records if you're going to sell to the public, all your invoices, receipts, which you will be for the VAT man or tax man, whatever, you should be keeping those receipts anyway, delivery notes, feed labels. They're all recommended that you keep them so that it can be traced back. And it sounds like, oh, well, that's an awful lot to do. What, what's that got to do with it? But there could be a problem with some of the feed you've been feeding, unbeknownst to you, you've been feeding your livestock. And if, if it's traceable, it will, the, the investigation will go past you and back down to the feed supply. The, the, the record keeping offers full traceability, better records offer more protection for you as well as the consumer. Keep a diary, write down any administration, medicines, feeding regime, any changes. Keep a diary in your pocket when you're walking around the farm, you take, you're divvying out some supplements, stick it in the, stick it in the diary. When you get back, you, your proper records should be kept up to date as well. All your medicine books, all that sort of thing must be kept up to date. So again, there's like plant protection, any, if you're spraying anything, that again should be on your records. Keep all the invoices, keep the delivery notes and anything else you're using on farm. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at that stuff. <laughs> slide on my screen, it's not on yours. So you'll see the press control. This this um, PowerPoint will be on the website. It'll be you, you'll be able to look at it again, right? So hazard analysis control point. It sounds very very fancy, but it it's something you should all be aware of. It's about recognizing where the points of contamination can be, the danger points, the danger for you. The farmers, where 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 can your stock get contaminated with something that could be passed on to the community, to the consumer? And you, we need to think about it. If you're doing this in a full scale business with a, you know, and you've got your own farm shop, you need to have full regulation. This will be part of your everyday life as your hack up plan it has to be there. It, it has to be checked with you. It will be checked and signed off by your local environmental health. It is, it's absolutely crucial to, to any business that's selling food. So even though you co won't come under these regulations with a small business, you still need to be aware that there are pressure points in your business where you need to be, be careful. You know, a critical control point. Remember that. <laughs> if you don't remember anything else, remember that one. Right, so we go into the next bit. Right, we know what these are. These are all the bugs that I think you've probably heard of most of these. Um, and they're all quite naturally occurring. You, you know, the, 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 the occur. So that says that they occur in the animal. We, we've got them ourselves in their own yet. And that's why you have to be careful. One of the big problems with carcasses is they're just dirty animals. We, the, that, all that mud and manure that's sticking around in the, on the animal can land up on the carcass and that's where contamination occurs. Right. The, that, this is again quoting from the health and hygiene regulations that red meat meat products have been implicated in many cases of foodborne illness. And I won't go won't read the whole thing out to you, perfectly capable of reading. But, but ta bacteria contamination of the fleece and hide can then be transferred onto previously sterile meat surfaces during slaughter and dressing. Visible cleanliness of the live animal has been shown to be directly related to carcass hygiene and hence can be used as one of a number of control points. There we are. Well, that's the control point being mentioned again there for improving the safety of red meat. So how do we reduce the risk? And this is where maybe some of my colleagues might be better able to 
to to add to this. You know, high dry matter diets produce cleaner animals than low dry matter diets. You know, they're eating rich food. They'll get skewer if they're stressed. They'll get skewer, and that can land up all over their coat, their coat. So, especially when you're thinking of taking them to slaughter, maybe just think about adjusting the diet a little. Maybe you know, make it a bit a bit drier so they're not going to produce so much feces. Although be be careful of changing your diet as it says there, it can be it's like, don't do it suddenly. <laughs> it can have adverse effects as well. So right. So transport, that's another big a, a big problem. If you can bring them indoors to let them dry and clean off. I would suggest handling get your animals used to handling. If you've got small quantities of animals. You can give them a hose down, tie them up in the halter, and give them a wash down before you put them in a dry shed with some some bedding. That's what it it is a good idea to have your animals used to handling for that. If not just for that reason, it is better to have in general to have your animals used to handle. Uh, bring them in, decrease the withdrawal of feed. There's a way of doing that so that they can't produce so much feces, clipping, clip all the bits here. You can see the, the underside, the brisket, the abdomen, legs, rump and tail, they're all points that can be a problem and try and get, just before you're taking them to slaughter, before you transport them, uh, you would look at clip, clipping these, these parts. Yeah, it might be worth always, um, if you go into uh, an abattoir for the first time, to make contact with them and ask them about what they'd be looking for in terms of these things um, and be clear that you know what time for dropping off and things like that as well. Yes, and timing is quite crucial so that they're not hanging around because that, that, that increases stress and that has its own problems on meat quality as well. So this is what it says, sort of the criteria for transporting. Again, I, I've just copied and pasted this. I have it. This is not me writing this myself. This is off the regulation. So, and although it's mainly aimed at uh, companies who transport animals for their living, it, it is if you're taking them in your own trailer, then the, the it's valid what you what you need to do. Animals should be dry at loading, kept dry at unloading. That sometimes can be an issue in the west coast of Scotland, but we can try. Straw bedding should be provided and the vehicles well ventilated. Adverse welling, stocking rates. The chances are for a small producer, you've only got a couple of beasts in your, in your trailer anyway. So these are some examples of pictures that are again taken of, of animals that could be rejected. That was quite, I personally was quite surprised. I didn't think that sheep looked too bad. However, they say that this could be, that the slaughterhouse would be perfectly within its rights to reject those animals. They're too dirty. And you could be sent home with your animals and the resulting costs from that. So you do have to be careful with them. Right, so some of these points is records, absolutely crucial to protect you, the, uh, not just the consumer. It is about you showing that you have done all, taken all reasonable care to prevent contamination. If you follow the rules, then that's, that's, what, it, that's what it's about. Try and preempt, try and look and see and think ahead as to where the problems could be. Prepare for your for slaughter, plan ahead, get it all booked up and prepare in advance and try and get your livestock clean and dry before. Reduce stress. And, you know, there's always going to be a certain level of stress with animals that are being transported that you, you can't deal with it altogether, but it is known that the reduction of stress improves meat tenderness and you get a better quality product. So all you can do to reduce the stress will improve your product and make it more saleable. Because people will come back and think, well, that was nice, and they'll come back and get some more. 
So I'm as part of this, I have set up some links there. They'll be on the, the PowerPoint, which will be on the website um, as to what you need to do. Basically, as a small producer, you're not obliged to follow, as I said before, you're not obliged to follow the major rules. The abattoir and your butcher are obliged to follow a code of you know practice and certain rules, and that's that's what's protecting you is the abattoir and the and the butcher. Um, I was going there's a couple there's two there's general information guidance there. You've got labelling protocols which I know I was asked about a couple of weeks ago, and I, I've put that up there so they can look. Food hygiene courses. I'd highly recommend it if you decide that you are going to sell direct to the public, you should look, think about doing a food hygiene course. It will give, even the, doing this, the first certificate, will give you a good understanding of the dangers of the various bacteria and how they can be transmitted and the different problems that they cause. I, I would say, seriously, say they're not expensive. I've looked in, some of them do them that, that in fact that particular one is actually a free is free courses but there are plenty that are very cheap I know some some often a certificate course for ten pounds so it's definitely worth looking into and I have to say that I've been surprised that the regulations aren't so well really aren't there for small producers I think that may change in the future given that there's been a great surge in demand for locally produced food. People are buying more and more local. And I think they may have to may start looking at regulation of small producers. As for licensing, the only thing you need to watch is if you're going to sell at a food uh, farmer's market or something like that, you need to contact your local food standards website will have you have to have a trader's license to do that. But apart from that, you're perfectly entitled to take your your cow or your sheep or your pig to the to the slaughterhouse and to the butcher and get it all packed up and he'll have he'll have the labeling requirements there and you and take it home and put it in the freezer or take it directly to your consumer if they've already booked the meat. You you can do that. But please, please be aware of some of the dangers that are there. And I would say that, I mean, there wasn't much guidance. As an ex chef, I can tell you that you're free, you, if you are going to freeze it, you may, should be released within three months. You, it should be dated the time it went into the freezer and the time it's due to come out. Your freezer should really run at minus 20. If it's been in a fridge, you, I would keep it below five degrees, between one one degree and five degree. Don't let it freeze in the fridge. That's almost as bad as letting it get too warm. The, the, I know that from from my experience as a chef, you have to keep, and you check these temperatures regularly. Get yourself on these food thermometers and check it at least once a week. When you're in the food, but it's working in the kitchen, you check them every day. The, all freezers and all fridges have to be checked for temperature. So I, it's a habit I would say you should get into. Because it's very easy to just not notice that that freezer is just not quite hitting temperature anymore. And you won't necessarily notice it might be, it might have risen to minus 15 and that's not enough. But you wouldn't necessarily notice it. So get those temperature gauges out and you've got, you've got storage. And that's, I'm afraid, the end of my presentation. I do apologise that it wasn't more formal. I have done my best over the last few days to try and work out what you need to be doing. And as I say, if you are going to be doing your own um, selling, direct, you know, directly from a farm shop and a much bigger scale than we've been talking about tonight, then you really, I recommend getting a good relationship with your food hygiene, local food hygiene officer. Um, they will, they will help you. That's what they're there for. They're there to help you get it right. So I'm um, open to questions. I will see if anybody can help you at all with some questions. <laughs>
No, we've got uh, a few questions that have come through the, the uh, Q&A uh, section already and the chat. So I'm going to merge the um, a, a couple from the Q&A thing. So um, the first one um, was uh, we had somebody uh, querying whether the, the farm to um, the farm to plate a exemption covered um, the um, the uh, when you were using an abattoir or a third party, if that exemption still held, was one of the queries. Uh, well, yes. I mean, as far as I could ascertain, plowing through these regulations, as long as you were take you took it to the abattoir, then that would go to the butcher quite often. Quite a lot of the smaller abattoirs have got butcher on site. Um, then yes, you you are exempt, and then you're taking it home and taking it and selling it to your, your sister or your auntie or to the pub down the road, that's perfectly allowed, that's allowed. Fantastic, okay, and then there's, I'm going to merge two questions uh, because uh, basically uh, quite a few people have been asking about what defines a small producer and what's the, if there's a, if there's a threshold in the, uh, in the guidance about what this, what a small quantity as regards food is. Uh, yes, hold on a minute and I'll go back to to my notes on those ones. Right, let's see. There we go. Right, I'm going to read it. Farm, farmers who sell primary products directly to the final consumer, e.g. farm gate sales for sales at local markets to retail shops for direct sale to the final consumer and to local restaurants. Individuals who collect products in the wild, such as mushrooms, berries, etc., to deliver the yield directly to the final consumer or to the local retail shops for direct sale to the final consumer and to local restaurants. That was the that was the definition of small quantities and um, of consumer and direct to the final consumer. That was so. That was part of the. the definition of exemption. Excellent. And um, we've got a question that goes uh, back to what you're talking about, freezers. Uh, can you confirm how long red meat can be kept in the freezer for sale? Um, I just I just touched on this briefly recently. Um, my always my understanding when I worked as a chef was you didn't really keep it longer than three months, although hygiene wise might allow you to keep it up to a year I think but I well, as a chef I certainly wouldn't recommend that the quality reduces considerably after three months. Excellent and the next question was I think it's just looking for a bit of um, uh, clarification when you were talking about uh, not uh, uh, animal feed was it 20 tons of silage that you were talking about was a yes. threshold? Yes yeah. yeah that was on feed, the, for the purposes of feed, small quantities has been defined as less than 20 tonnes per annum. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to go to the question in the chat. Um, now, uh, maybe Ross would like to answer this, if you want to unmute yourself, Ross. Um, and how long should the feed withdrawal, cattle, uh, withdrawal be for cattle before transport? Yeah, how old are you? Yes, I was, um, I was remembering back to my peg days and also on farm, on cattle and sheep farms. People would normally overnight say they had a early morning collection or you take them early morning. They would probably restrict them feed overnight. Maybe give them a bit of straw just to give them a bit of fill, but certainly no more than 24 hours. It was normally just overnight, but and uh, that makes a big difference because, as you can imagine, uh, the, the abattoir doesn't want gut fill. They don't want to deal with that as as uh, less as possible. So, yeah, twenty four hours to certainly no. Let's try get certainly twelve hours if you can. Excellent. Thanks, Ross. And um, just looking through the chat now, um, and uh, somebody's just clarifying the important point that if you're doing home kill, uh, that shouldn't be for selling. And also you've got to watch a little bit with the, the, uh, the 
uh, how you dispose of the guts and stuff with that. Obviously, mm. there's rules about that. Um, and um, uh, we've got a, 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 a crofters uh, pointed out uh, that it's important that you uh, that the register is a food is business establishment, and it's a very simple online process, and um, and that can be done. So that's one of these things, Jane, you're hoping to create discussion groups and that so people can share knowledge yeah. between various small producers yeah. of what they've done and how, how it's worked for them. So, and that'll be part of the follow on uh, uh, information on the website and we can uh, share helpful links like that. So th thank you very much everyone for taking part. Um, uh, again, uh, um, then there's a bit of discussion in the chat about uh, how long, um, uh, just touching what you'd said before about how long uh, can you sell frozen meat for and the labels um, often say uh, a year but you uh, from a quality perspective would be recommended less Jane is that right? Yeah, yeah. Th three months definitely you get beyond three months you get a definite deterioration in quality of the meat. Fantastic. And uh, another helpful suggestion has come from a, a, a marketing outlet uh, that can be used and we'll share all these uh, information at the end. And um, then um, so we'll move on to some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, um, and one of these is asking about um, because of their location, they're very far away from an abattoir. It can be a two days journey if we're traveling. Is there any mobile abattoir plans afoot? Uh, from my knowledge, there was uh, surveys about uh, at night, uh, mobile abattoirs, but I haven't heard any feedback from those surveys yet. But that's something that we'll definitely uh, look into and share as part of Jane's discussion groups as well. Um, um, and is somebody's uh, asking about uh, labelling the because their butcher doesn't label the packs and uh, uh, will you be able to help provide some information on what goes on the meat labels? There is on one of the links at the on the last but one slide. Oops, oops disappeared. <laughs> Sorry. Now, while Jane's looking, I think there's a question that we'll definitely be following up with an answer afterwards because it's, it involves a dried a meat using dried liver for dog treats. So I don't think any of us know that answer, but it's an interesting diversification. So we'll definitely follow that up after the meeting. Um, um, if, can everybody see that? There, there is on the, la on the last one slide information on labelling protocols and that, that's a direct link to the food standards on on, on labelling and then from the minimum standards to the I there are different levels. There's a minimum you require to have on the front and there's some so much you require on the back as well and it gives you all the the requirements for that on that link. Excellent. So there's a, a good few questions that will maybe just merge uh, uh, when asking you, Jane, and it's about um, if you've, uh, what would be the rules where if you uh, used a slaughterhouse uh, and then you got um, half carcasses back, uh, what um, what do you need to do butchery at home if you're going to do more of that processing at home? Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think as soon as you start doing any of those processes at home, you come under more strict I think that I think then you may come under the guidelines, the full health and safety yeah. well, we standards can, guidelines. But I can I can I can go and research that and look yeah. into it and get back on that one. We can maybe try and create a flow chart to uh, help people decide where, where they're yeah. where they're falling in. Um, um, so and then this is another question, maybe a bit about infrastructure. If um, then uh, if people are working meat boxes, so they're uh, at the abattoir and they're being butchered at the abattoir, other than fridges and freezers, what other facilities should they think about uh, having or are required to have? Um, proper packaging. I think we can be very careful with your packaging. If you're going to be packing your boxes, I'm not sure whether that would bring you under your becoming a food premises then rather than just a production unit and I think that may come under 
the full food hygiene regs. But I'm not sure. Again, I will need to, to look at look that up. Great. So um, now another question about home butchery units, uh, and this involves a question of collaboration. Uh, they're currently building their own butchery unit, but it's not going to be used all the time. Uh, can they allow others to use the facility or would that make them a meat processing plant with greater regulations? I suspect it would make them a good, I think it would. But we can uh, we can uh, clarify, I can clarify that. that, but I'm yeah, I would say that probably does. I, I, I think it sounds like a good idea for the German, the almost community approach to, to the butchery, but I, I suspect it would bring you in under, it doesn't mean it's not unachievable, you know, it sounds like, oh, help, help, I don't want to be getting into that. Your environmental health officer will help you with that. Most of them are quite, you, you do get the artificial one, but most of them are very helpful and very good and will give you genuine advice on how to proceed. Um, and here's a question from the chat. Uh, does it matter how long I transport the meat uh, home from the butcher uh, or would you need to, to keep the cold chain? Would you need a refrigerated van or temperature checks? Mm. Um, I couldn't, I didn't find any regulation on this. It's something that actually occurred to me and I'm not 100% sure. I don't think so. I don't think there is regulation on it, but Sense would tell you that if it is going to be a distance, then you, you either highly insulated and packed with ice blocks would be recommended. Ah, now we've got a, a non-meat question. Uh, can I sell a surplus fresh veg at a market without being registered? Uh, mm. it, like if there's a market stall that's, that, that does other stuff, but can you just have a wee sideline of veg every so often when it's available? Or would you um, still, you still register as a food producer? Um, I probably would be inclined to register. As you would have to have, if you're going to be on a market stall anyway, you would have to have a street trader's license. If you've got the stall anyway, you would have that license. You can't, you can't trade off a, a, a stall. I don't think that, that applies to anything you're selling. So yeah, you could introduce vegetables, but there's a whole new set. There's a whole other set of guidelines and regulations for vegetables. I could, I could certainly look at if I, I, I came across that in my research in the last few days. So we could certainly post now a link up to that. Yeah, and, we, and we'll have things because there's been a lot of work the Farm Advisory Service has done with pollen yes, crops been. and things. Yeah. So we'll be able to uh, include uh, links to those marketing options from there, definitely. Um, now, we come up a, a, a question about um, are there certain rules or regulations for posting? Uh, the year into meat business then, and then you will have to be comply with the full food standards yes so that would be uh, in the flow chart uh, posting would put you in a in a yeah. much tighter bracket yeah and uh, this might be a good time to point out that there's a lot of interest from consumers in having um a, a low waste packaging so uh, things uh, like um use uh, products that use wool to help insulate and that are something to maybe consider because uh, people are uh, increasingly concerned about wasteful packaging so at the start of your business that's maybe something to consider looking into um great well uh oh no there's more questions fantastic i thought we'd come to an end but no we haven't um, um can you advise on what in uh, uh, insurance uh, people should think about getting um poor I mean, I would, I would talk to the NFU. It's not something that I've looked into. I, I couldn't honestly tell you. I think the NFU would probably give you better advice on that. Yeah, well, we can certainly ask as they've done helpful things yeah. for the Farm Advisory Service before yeah, I'm sure they will. on cover <laughs> grazing. So I'm sure we can get them to yeah. clarify what the key things are. Mm. So it's um, uh, what the key insurance requirements are that are out mm. with the standard uh, public liability and employer's yeah. liability. We'll, we'll confirm that and Jane will share that. Um, Excellent. So um, now, Ross, the, the chat was going a bit of a flurry there. How, do you think I've uh, missed any? <laughs> Apologies as I have. Mm. 
sorry, I was muted. No, I think I'm it's a great amount of questions. Yeah, I think you've got them all. But certainly we'll, we'll go through them and we can we can make sure everyone because there's a few ones we have to make sure we give you the correct answer. Yeah, well, in general, we'll it's, it's great. Fantastic. So yeah. at this point, while people are maybe thinking a few, few more questions, Jane, do you want to maybe just tell us about the uh, the next steps for this project? Yes, yeah, certainly. I The next step is we're going to hopefully early summer sometime hold a discussion group. So I will probably email everybody who's attended one of the last three meetings and I'll be asking for volunteers to join that discussion group. So and what I'm trying to establish is what you, the farmer, needs from us in the way of information. The, the culmination of this project is to have a website where you can go to get the information. There will be technical notes, there'll be links and general startup information for anybody who wants to think about selling their food direct. And, you know, as Jeanette says, we can establish a flow chart as to if that, then this, and you can follow that through to see what you need to do, whether it's the full regulations you need to be adhering to, or whether you come under the lighter suggested regulation, if you like, like for selling direct. Um, that's ultimately the aim. So any volunteers for the discussion group would be great because that will help us formulate exactly what you're looking for. And for any meetings in the future, um, whether, you know, whether the first meeting was a marketing, do we need to, do people want training and so, more specific training in social media, for example, that's the kind of thing we're going to be looking at, is what you, the potential producer needs from, from the information that you get. Fantastic. And we've already had a suggestion about that. It would be quite uh, useful to have um, a, some kind of Facebook group, maybe a bit like the Women in Agriculture have, mm, yeah. that would allow people who are interested in selling meat directs to uh, share experiences. And yeah. uh, there's a, a, a agreement with the importance of a, a, a discussion group. Um, we've got a question about uh, distances. Uh, how far away is a local shop, retail uh, outlet or restaurant? <laughs> I never came across a definition of that. It's a really good question, actually. I, I never came across a definition of that. It just refers, all the regulations refer to local direct selling, to local markets. And I'm not sure what that means, because we don't, you know, we all live in a rural area. Local can mean 20, 30 miles or more than to us. So I'm not sure. I, I, I can go and see if I can find out. If I can, event, if I can get an environmental health person to talk to me I will I will ask that question. Fantastic and we've got a, another uh, non-meat related thing and this is about a uh, sort of farm gate sales of honey that there's no licenses and stuff but there is a uh, importance of labeling regs and uh, although again not meat related uh, in the farm advisory service we've done advice on egg selling and when these different rules of farm gate or um, when you would need to uh, have a, a code and be stamping eggs kick in so we can also share that as part of Jane's discussion group um, so I'm um, excellent we're having lots of uh, interest in being part of the discussion group so this is clearly um, um, a, a, a hot topic um, fantastic um, and yet yeah, we'll definitely share the egg guidance that's no bother at all um, oh sorry I've, I'm not keeping up with the questions here apologies everyone so um, um, and there's a, a, a little bit, I, I, uh, we'll, we'll clarify again um, where, the, um, where the thresholds come from registering as a food business establishment. And also another follow on question that's similar is um, the, um, if the, the, um, to revisit the question about the, the quantity that what counts as a small quantity is like, uh, maybe to try and put that in terms of how many like live live animals going to slaughter as well as in kilograms maybe <laughs> yeah i again the, as a lot of these definitions are a bit vague as to what's of what is considered to be small quantities um the only thing was if when you're producing feed it was the 20 tons and that was the only time I saw a 
specific number. Um, it's just they, they said selling direct small sell primary products directly to the final consumer farm gate sales or sales at local markets. Uh, it doesn't we, actually give a number on that. And we do have a number that's come in from the group for when it's regarding poultry, small quantities is, it sounds a big number to me, it's uh, under 10,000. So we'll, we'll get that, that for, yeah. relevant for all yeah. relevant sectors. Yeah, that is a big number. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, for the, somebody who has a small number of hens like myself, yes, it does sound a big number, <laughs> but compared to probably chicken plants, that would maybe yeah. be one shed, so. <laughs> yeah. So I think they're talking quite, it, it sounds like that they regard, you know, it's, it's more about the directly selling to the consumers. I presume you could probably have quite a big farm but as soon as it, and it, if the meat's going through the abattoir in the butcher and comes directly out to your consumer, I think you could have, it sounds like you could have quite a big establishment as long as you're selling direct. It's as soon as you start having premises on, you know, a, a building that you're using to pack or process that meat, then you, you come under the regulation. And uh, Ross, who's on the uh, call, he has a lot of experience with pigs. So if anyone's got any specific pig questions, uh, please don't ask me, but you can ask Ross. And also, I, I worked in a slaughterhouse for six months as a student. Had a great time. It was good. Learned a lot. Learned a lot. So I think it's important. That, I think I've seen one question there about, they're talking about underbellies and that of lambs and you have to do it for use and on wedders, you basically got to do it for every stock because yeah. uh, one of the things I was just thinking there, even the, the slaughterman's knife, if it's going through um, long wool and such, it's going to blunt it. So they're going to just, just no, no time for that. So it's important that it's, it's nice and clean so they can get a, they're very sharp knives. As you can imagine, so it's nice and clean that they can get a good cut without blunting it so much. So it, it gives it gives them because you can imagine a line of lamb just non-stop. I was at the end of the line picking them off, <laughs> and they're all the carcass bit. It's just incredible the speed they go at. That's in a big abattoir, of course, but even in a small scale one, it's all about cleanliness as James talked about there. Yes, it's uh, it's very impressive to see the the, the welfare and the, the respect and the quietness that a well run abattoir does. It's, it's yeah. it is is it is very impressive. Well That's I think good. I think we're we've come uh, come to an end of our questions, but we're clearly uh, at the uh, birth of the beginning of a very busy uh, discussion group and Facebook group. So thank you all good. very yeah. much for your for your time. And uh, again, apologies if I missed any uh, questions in the chat as I went through, but we'll all uh, we'll go through them all afterwards, and we'll definitely um, we'll clarify anything. Uh, and make sure that the uh, that you all, that we share all all the correct answers. And if there's anything um, if there's anything in the meantime, please uh, 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 contact Jane, and uh, we can uh, keep the momentum going. So um, we can uh, increase the amount of local food sold. So yeah. um, like to thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Jane for doing the presentation and Ross for keeping all the technology on the road and I'd like to thank you all very much for attending tonight and again any uh, we really appreciate your time I know um, filling in feedback forms is dull but we'd really appreciate your uh, time filling in um, just so we can make sure that we get these sessions to be as tailored and useful as possible. Uh, if unless, unless there's anything else, we'll, uh, I'd like to, uh, again, thank you all very much for coming. And um, yes, and I look forward to being involved as, uh, the, as, the, as the group develops. And thank you very much, Jane, for all your hard work. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending.